Greetings, Dr. Jeffrey Scott here. I am actually doing this from my hotel room in Tokyo, Japan. My wife thought I'd be retiring by now, so she booked three weeks in Asia on a retirement trip. But I'm not ready to retire. My email address is hgsidoc at gmail.com. Again, my name is Jeffrey Scott, and I titled this week's version All-Time Highs for Spider and the Dow. And the question is, do we just continue to run up into the inauguration? Will we peak going into the election? Or is this just a bull trap and we're not going to stay up for very long? I think all those are possible scenarios. I'm in the camp that we probably run up to the election and I reevaluate. As always, this is for educational purposes only. Anything I talk about should be taken in the spirit of education and investment advice. I'm a doctor, not a broker. Um, I am independent of any major software company. I have worked with several different folks to develop my indicators for their tool set. Rob Hoffman for Wealth Charts, Van for the TradeStation App Store, Praveen for TradingView. Um, but outside that, I don't really have any other affiliations. Um, my indicators will likely show up in some other tool sets that I'm working with as well. All the tools that I use, I've paid for, and trading involves risk, you are solely responsible for any investment decisions you make. Um, any commentary I make is mine alone, and if I use a tool, you can assume I'm using it because I like to use it, not because someone pays me to use it and say good or bad things about anybody. If you like these videos and you want something shorter, StocksAndDocs.com is a site that I do on a daily basis when I'm not traveling in Asia. Um, please note the audio today may be subpar as I'm doing this with the built-in mic on the computer. I always like to start by looking at the week we just finished. And five-day returns on the left, they're actually kind of muted. Um, great. They're, they're bullish. Um, and the one that only went over 2% was a leveraged ETF. But you got to be excited when you see not just the large cap growth FANG names leading, but the IBD50 has been making a resurgence. In fact, it's only 5% off its 52-week high. Um, if you look at the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P, the Russell, and the NYSE, they're all up a little bit around 1%, lower on the NYSE and a little bit higher on the Dow and the NASDAQ. But over five days, that's a decent return. We'll take it. You could see Friday was mostly a bullish day, certainly for the indices. What lagged on the week? Natural gas after giving us a couple week tees. Um, treasuries also down on the week as rates rose. Now, over here, you can see that the 52-week low date, we're about to lap it in the next two weeks. And if you look at the performance on the major indexes, this is a massive bull market that we've been in through the October 27, 26 lows. And you'll see on my timing model, the signal to go long was November 6th. And if you follow my timing model in the S&P, you're still long, riding a, a pretty significant return. On the sectors, you can see technology, industrials, financials led on the week. And you know when you see utilities at the bottom, um, yeah, it's probably a good thing. Um, you don't want a bull market led by utilities. Surprisingly, discretionary communications lagged um, as well. This is Sagar's Q Edge tool. I love it during the day to give me a sense of what's going on in the market. Um, and this is at the S&P 1500. You could see 59% of the stocks are above the midline, modestly bullish. You could see a pretty equal distribution of where the stocks are sitting within their Bollinger Bands and nothing excessive above or below. You could see on Friday, all the sectors were up 94% of the industry groups and 89% of the stocks. So hopefully you had a pretty good return <clears throat> on Friday. And if you look out over two weeks, you could see the markets are 50-50 market. So um, up and down market, ending up higher on the week, but certainly stronger the last couple of sessions. If you look at the breadth view, which is another Sagar market breadth tool, this one's powered by Metastock data. You could see we had another Hindenburg Omen on this combined NASDAQ and NYSC on Wednesday. But then on Friday, a strong day, and you'll see the NYSE actually gave us an accumulation day. 
When you look at the NASDAQ on the left and the NYSC, you could see nice uptrends. And you could see that that Hindi signal actually fired on the NASDAQ, not on the NYSC. This little bluish green line, that's a three-month new high, new low. This is a daily chart I'm looking at. And these two lines here represent the be careful zone. And this is the load them up zone on the bottom. And we're getting towards an overbought scenario, certainly in the NYSE, not yet on the NASDAQ. <clears throat> if you look at the individual indices, you'll notice that on the daily charts, all of them, except for maybe the Russell 2000, are getting into that be careful zone, meaning these stocks are getting extended. And when markets get into this zone, you can notice this is a Dow, it's only 30 stocks, so that was hard to talk about. But for the most part, when you get in, you don't stay for long. And when you come out, usually you get a little bit of a pullback or a sideways motion in the markets. Now, this is my weekly timing model. This is in a new product that I'm working on, which we call Market MRI Pro. Um, more to follow about that. And right now, ignore the little green lines because that's something we're still adjusting. But what I wanted to show you, if I apply my weekly timing model, this is Spider, Q's, Diamonds, and Russell. This is the 30 period WMA. And on the top is the weekly bongo because it's a weekly chart. Notice this is what you don't see in my other platforms. I actually built the buy sell indicator, or should I say Praveen, on my behalf. And you could see the spider has been in a buy signal since the bottom of the market there. Um, the Russell and the diamonds have been there for several weeks. Interestingly, for the first time in a number of weeks, we actually flipped to a bullish bongo on the weekly on the Qs and on the buy sell. So the NASDAQ joined the party. This is another tool. Um, many of you have seen me use Nick Drendel's tool. It's still a great tool. I wanted to expand upon it. And so what we can look here is the major indexes. And you could see their one day percent move. The biggest move from the prior close was seen in the IWM. You could see the range, big range, 2.26% range on the Russell, and you could see where it closed within the range. Very bullish closes. You could see at the close, the new high, new lows improved on the NYSE and the NASDAQ. Then right here, I've got the different sectors. You can see the strength being in, and this is looking at just the S&P 500, which is different than Segar's tool, which is looking at the 1500. And you could see that the financials were up 1.93, the industrials 1.79 on Friday. You could also look at the five-day return, the 20-day return, and the 50-day return. Notice over the last 50 days, things look very good. And then I have a number of theme ETFs, um, data sharing, genomics, biotech are up at the top. But again, the same thing. And this is great intraday because it gives you a sense of how much you've moved from the open, what your one-day change is, your 5, 20, and 50, and then where you fell in the closing range. Strong stocks were closed near the top of the range. Now, as I dive into what's making this market move, I like to start here with interest rates, the 10-year on the left in white, the S&P the spider in yellow. And you could see both the 10-year on the left and the 30-year on the right were up considerably, over 2% for both of them. What's driving that? I thought the Fed is cutting rates. Well, I think we had some strong economic data and we had some mixed economic data, to be fair. And I think the fact the market was up on the week means the net result of that economic data is the smart money thinks we're still going to see the rate cuts. I see the rates go up. Is this because the rest of the world is tightening faster or does somebody know something that I don't know? I think it's something that we need to watch. Um, I think a lot of what's going on now in the markets, the bullishness is driven by the rates being cut. Is there a recession in our near future? There always is a recession in our near future. Just when? And my bet has been after the inauguration. And you could see that the yield curve inversion or reinversion back to normal on the 10-2 which occurred a couple weeks ago, is being maintained. And the gray bars that occur after this blue line crosses the zero line show you that pretty much every time this happens, you get a recession. But there's a lag till you get that recession. So 
When? No one knows. Will we get one? Of course we'll get one. We always get recessions. And if you look here, the 10 minus 3, it's closing. But I think the key one when you think about recession risk is the 10 too. Now, I thought this was interesting. The, the uh, diffusion index for the Federal Reserve District 3, Philadelphia, which is a measure of economic activity, actually has gone back to positive. Hard to believe you got a recession when the economic activity is improving. And then the other thing is during recessions, you could see that spike in this blue line, which is a Bank of America, U.S. High Yield Index Option Adjusted Spread, a measurement of money tightness, and we don't see any of that right now. So, yeah, we have a recession coming, but not tomorrow, not anywhere soon based upon this chart. Now, if I look at breadth, I can see stocks above the 200-day came down a bit. Stocks above the 40 came down a bit, and they came down from areas, you know, areas where we typically reverse. The one thing that is potentially concerning, and I pointed it out before, this is the this white line is a weekly chart of the three-week new high, new low, and it's getting to an area where we always get a bit of a pause or a pullback. And you could see when we peaked here, we pulled back. When we peaked here, the yellow pulled back. When we peaked here, the yellow pulled back. When we peaked here, we had a little bit of a pullback and kept on going. Uh, a peak here, we pulled back. So I pay attention to this. We're peaking. That suggests to me that we'll have, at minimum, maybe a little bit of a stalling pattern. The current buckets, this is Edge Raider, looking at the S&P 1500. Um, looks a little different than Sagar's at 71%. Uh, and you know why? Because I'm looking at the wrong date. Well, I copied the wrong one over, so let's ignore that. But let's look at this way. Here is a way in my new app or should I say Praveen's new app, that shows the buckets across the NYSE. And notice the, the little white shaded there, that was yesterday's. The green is, well, that was Thursday's, the green's Friday's. And notice that we shifted to the right, meaning the reds got lower and the left, and the greens got higher. That shows some strength in the market, but not excessive strength. The NASDAQ, similar pattern. The S&P 1500 are moving up close to 9% above not really worrisome, and the same thing on the Russell 1000. So pretty much across the board, this is showing in improvement in the major indices. Now, I like to see a bullish pattern. It's when this over here 11, which would be how many stocks are above the Bollinger Bands in that index, starts to get in the 20s and 30s, that I get worried. And if I'm looking for a bounce after a pullback, it's when the reds get in the 20s or 30s over here on the zero, which is below the Bollinger Bands. Now, all this bullishness, I'm excited, I'm excited, but why am I still getting a bunch of Hindenburg Omens on the, um, the NASDAQ? And that's something that has to at least make me be a bit concerned. Um, now, does it mean the market's over? No, it doesn't mean the run is over. It just tells me that to keep a little bit in the back of my mind that all think, though things feel really rosy, um, the NASDAQ hasn't set all-time highs, um, although we did on the Spider and the Dow Jones, but maybe we'll get there on the NASDAQ as well. NYSE <clears throat> is now cleared by 30 days, the last Hindenburg Omen signal. So on the week, this is taking all the stocks above $2.50 and 250,000 shares and looking at performance. And you could see for the most part, we are above the zero line. And then it's these different numbers here represent ERG, which is combining earnings per share rank, relative strength rank and group rank. And you could see, eh, it's hard for me to say there's a pattern except to see there's broad based bullishness. I always ignore below 40 and above 270. And the reason for that is we start to get very, very few stocks. And when you do that, pretty much broad-based positivity. If we look at earnings per share and gain, gain on the left, earnings per share groups here, really not much of a pattern. Relative strength, not much of a pattern. This thing down here tells me that the groups that were lagging the prior week actually led. So more rotation in the market. On the right is a tool in HGSI called the Group Performance Analysis Tool, where you could take static groups of stocks, and I always build these groups the prior Friday, and then you can see how they would have performed over the subsequent week, buying $1,000 of every stock, so there'll be fractional shares. 
Now, my buy watch was 48 wins, 10 losses, up 4.35%. Now, this Mike Scott focus list, this is a great cancel list, was up 4.38. So there were some really great returns in the market. My filtered buys, which looks more of pullbacks, um, actually lagged a bit at 2.57, um, but still above the S&P 500, which was at 2%. And my current holdings, which have been doing really well the last few weeks, lagged at positive 1.64. Now, that assumes equal weights of each position. It assumes um, um, stocks, no stops, and it assumes no change to that list over the week. So it really doesn't mean anything on anybody's performance, mine included. But what it means is this was a week where the bulls did better than the bears. And you see IBD 50 the weekend review and Marcus Smith growth all above the S&P 500. And that says good things for growth. Know your news and earnings dates. You could see we've got Fed head speaking on Monday, on Tuesday, and on Friday. We have some manufacturing on Tuesday, import prices on Wednesday, the jobless complex, retail sales, Philadelphia Fed manufacturing, on Thursday, business inventories, confidence on how home building starts on Friday, permits as well. I think we're at a point now where we want these to come in on predictions. If they come in hot, that makes some people question whether we'll still see the rate cuts. If they come in cold, then we start worrying about recession. So I think this is Goldilocks where we want it to be just right. Earnings, plenty of earnings this week as this is the second week and probably the first Big one of the next earnings season. And you could see not much occurs on Monday. Bond markets closed for Columbus Day. Um, but you can see that we start to see more airlines, uh, more of the banks. The banks really knocked it out of the park on Friday. Both regional banks look good and the, the big banks. Um, and a nice smattering investment banks, Morgan Stanley, then the first of the Fang Complex, Netflix on Thursday. So I think it's an important week of earnings. The following next couple of weeks are going to be very, very big on earnings. And maybe what we saw last week was some window dressing, repositioning before earnings season. And I like this quote on the bottom. It's a judgment call to hold stocks over earnings dates. It's bad judgment to know when your stock's earnings date is scheduled. So what are my thoughts? Somewhat choppy week for stocks. The major indices exhibit an up and down action, ultimately rallying on Friday. The S&P and Dow's set record highs. The market placed geopolitical worries along with concerns about Hurricane Milton Helene on the back burner. And believe me, I live in Florida. They're not on the back burner there and focused on economic releases and Fed policy. The CPI was hotter than expected, both actual and core. The year-over-year -year growth increased and the growth of headline CPOs, CPI slowed, however, to 24 from 2.5%. The September PPI and consumer sentiment data for October, which also came in, also did support the idea that the Fed will continue cutting rates. My market timing model is long. I'm long the market, letting my positions run. But since I'm traveling, <clears throat> my stops are in place, as they should be anyways. As long as the Fed appears to be in easing mode, it's hard to fight the bull. I'll be closely looking to the economic data and have that Hindi in the back of my mind do we rally into the election? And then what happens? So this concludes the first part. I'm going to post this now because I'm not sure when I'll get to the stock review. And then sometime later, um, we're Sunday here already in Japan, sometime late Sunday here, which will be overnight Saturday, <clears throat> I'll do my stock analysis. Hope you have a great week. I will be spotty on Stocks and Docs this week. And probably, since I'll be on a ship, may not do a, a video for next Sunday. Thank you.